Happy Wednesday, everybody. Hey, good evening. Amen. It's good to be in the Lord's house to worship uh, for Bible study. Uh, I want to just remind you guys that, uh, man, it is like April's almost over. Amen. It's is where I know we're just getting started, but before you know, it'll be over. Uh, at the end of the month, April 30th, we are going to have a big family night. Uh, we got four men who are graduating CLM. Uh, four men, right? Is, is that right? We're, uh, or two, two men? Uh, listen, um, why don't y'all stand up real quick? Tommy and Christopher, man, very good. Very awesome. And uh, we're, and we're going to celebrate their graduation and have dinner that night. Uh, so be in prayer for that. Uh, also, um, we're having our regular men's and women's meetings this month. I'm very excited about that. Uh, and we do want to continue to lift up. Uh, did y'all enjoy Easter? Yeah. It was a, a wonderful time. Uh, listen, the bacon was great. Amen. It was. But man, God's spirit was better. Amen. It was just a, a wonderful time. Uh, and, and during this period, I know that some of us have been praying and fasting uh, these, this past 40 days. We know uh, Jesus, um, did anybody remember how many days he uh, walked the earth after the resurrection? 40 days he wandered. And they, they say that on the day of the Jewish festival, Pentecost, what came? The Holy Spirit. Amen. So I would just encourage and challenge you to continue to dig into God's word these next 50 days, amen, and see what he reveals to you. Uh, and I'm praying about maybe us having a, a service to celebrate uh, the Holy Spirit uh, in, in about 50 days' time. But uh, that, that's uh, just a few of the announcements we have. Uh, there's a few things we want to definitely keep in prayer. One is if you would please uh, lift up a buddy of mine. His name is Aaron Wyndham. Uh, some of y'all might remember him. But uh, he, he helped lead worship here for uh, many years while he was uh, a young man. And uh, he's been in the hospital the last uh, seven days with um, some type of intestinal virus. And, uh, but he, he got to come home today, which is very awesome. Um, but just keep him in your prayers. They don't even know what was going on. You know, when the doctors don't know, they say it was a virus. Amen. <laughs> Must have been a virus, you know, but he couldn't eat or uh, drink very little. Uh, and so, and it's just so curious, you know, earlier this year, he did a seven day fast for Jesus and he never did something like that. And it was like the devil came at him, right? For how long? Seven days. Seven days. I just think that's curious, but I told him, I was like, listen, God's trying to bring a story out of this. And, um, and I don't know what you're facing, but I can tell you this, that God never wastes a hurt. He never wastes a, a hard time. And so just to tell you, if you're struggling, if you're going through a hard time, God's just writing a story. And, uh, and I know how my story ends. Do you know how yours end? Amen. And uh, so just keep uh, my brother Aaron lifted up. Uh, we want to lift up Parker Mosley tonight. Uh, please pray for a young man named Christopher. Uh, he is the son of Miss uh, Linda Bowman. And he is going through a hard time at the hospital as well. Uh, lift that family up. Uh, please pray for Jimmy Brown. Uh, also be in continued prayer for Miss Keeley's mother. And also I want to lift up Adam Jones tonight. He's been having some health issues as well. If you would just please keep him lifted up. And also uh, Miss Peggy Jenkins, she had hip replacement today and everything went good and, and she's home and, and um, Miss Joyce is spending the night with her tonight and Sheldon said he's happy to have the bed to himself. So, um, <laughs> but, uh, but just keep um, uh, Miss Peggy, that ain't gonna last long, is it, Brother Earl? Amen. Uh, but just uh, keep Miss Peggy in, in your prayers and, and tomorrow morning, Miss Barbara Morris having her hip replacement and uh, around 10.30, so if y'all would just be in prayer for her and she is going to stay the night at the hospital just to be cautious. So, But, uh, but is there anything else we can lift up for prayer or, or praise? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Brother Hans, he's hanging in there. But you just keep on lifting up Brother Hans Etheridge. He made it the Easter service. But, uh, but just keep on praying for him. Um, uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, you know, continue to lift up Miss Sharon Williams. Thank you. Uh, yes, ma'am.
Amen. We all pray for Tammy Crawford that she won't have to have surgery on her ankle. Amen. Y'all, y'all pray for her. Uh, yes, sir. All right. Well, we'll continue to lift up Tim and uh, pray for Tim's mama. Amen. Uh, what else? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, continue to lift up Miss Belinda. All right. Amen. Uh, we'll continue to lift up Brother Britt Moore. Amen. And uh, what else do you want to pray for? Yes, ma'am. Yes, and we'll lift up Miss Pam Henson. Uh, yes, sir. Oh, yeah, yeah yes, sir. Uh, continue to lift up Miss Parker Mosley. Uh, yes, sir. I want to lift up Miss Tammy. Miss Tammy Craig. Uh, what else? I want to lift up. Pray. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. The Lord's got it. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. What else? Anything else? Well, amen. Well, church, how many of y'all believe in prayer? Amen. amen. Well, uh, you know, I, I'm going to, of course, lift up all these requests, but um, I'm going to go and, and turn over this time to just Jesus. And so if you need prayer, why don't you come to the altar during this time? And if you don't need prayer, maybe you should pray over somebody. Amen. And so, uh, and if you, you, you want to sit still, that is all right, amen, but we're going to just go into a time of prayer, and so if you need prayer at this time, just, just come to the altar and give someone the opportunity of just praying for you or over you, or, or you just want Jesus' time. Um, but I know that we all probably have something we can bring to Jesus tonight, and at God's appointed time, I'll pray, and, and if you would like me to pray with you over something, I'll be right here, so... But let's, uh, let's go to Jesus in prayer. Let's just stand up and, and give him our attention and glory and honor. And we're just going to go into a time of prayer. And so I'm going to say three, two, one. And if God is moving you, you come.
Heavenly Father, as we just come before you in prayer and worship and celebration of Jesus, uh, God, we ask that we would see revival. And Lord, we ask for revival as a church many times, Lord. I, I hear it almost every year we ask for revival. When, Lord, true revival started when in the tomb, Lord, in that first breath you breathed in, Lord, uh, in which you conquered death. And, Father, you promised that in due time that they would receive the Holy Spirit and that they would be filled with power from on high and that they would not have a spirit of timidity or fear or, or, um, or confusion, but, Lord, a spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind. And God, we just ask your forgiveness for in times in which we have let doubt and fear and bitterness and hurt and pain, the wind and the waves to get our eyes off of where we need to keep our eyes. God, we ask that as we dive into your word tonight, Lord, that we would hear the word of God and Lord, that we as the people of God would respond to it. And Lord, that there would be many things within us tonight, Lord, that you would breathe life back into. God, we ask that you would begin revival in our hearts tonight. And Lord, that we would see the fruits of revival within our community, within our homes, within our children. God, we thank you. We praise you for this time that we can just pray to you and for others. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. All God's people say Amen and amen. Thank you all. Um, praise God. Uh, if you would, take your Bibles and turn to 2 Kings chapter 4. We have been going through the prophets, and we started with Elijah, and we are now at his disciple Elisha, and we're seeing how God is moving in his ministry and the miracles and the words that he is speaking over the kings and over those who are in positions of power. Uh, last Wednesday, we kind of touched on it, uh, the, because the Wednesday night before that, we see uh, we saw two she bears come out of woods and kill. Uh, how many kids was it? Forty-two boys, wasn't it? And at the end of last chapter, we had a king, the king of the Moabites, sacrificed his heir to the throne, his own son, um, to ensure his safety in the battle. And so, within that that spectrum. Uh, of scriptures, once again, we see uh, a generation basically offering up a, another generation in what? Sacrifice. And I want to ask you as just adults, how many of you all are parents? And you got home, and, and a lot of us are parents. How many of you are grandparents? Any of you are grandparents here? How many of you would have skipped the kids and went to the grandkids? Amen. I think uh, some people are like, praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, and so it would not be an, 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 not an obvious question to ask you, what is treasure for parents? What is treasure for you in your home and towards your future? What, what is treasure to you? Your children. Your children. They are, a, as the Bible says, a heritage of the Lord. That, that is our future. And what we see within the Bible is what happens when a generation messes up, it always affects the generations to come. Amen? That's what we, we historically see throughout the Bible. What happens in one generation plays out into the next generation, into the next generation, and what we even call these as generational curses. And so in saying this, we, we see what affects the, the youth and those kids in Bethel when they came out and to pick on that prophet Elisha and they, they picked on his bald head, amen, and they, they told him, why don't you go up like your former uh, prophet did up into heaven, why don't you get out of here? What they were really telling him to do was take you, your office, your God, and get out of here. And most kids, they learn how to hate, and they learn how to be mean, and they learn how to speak unkindly. Who do they often learn that from? Yeah, us. Man, how many of you, uh, have, like, your kid, they heard you might have say one thing one time. Like, one time, they heard you say, like, one thing one time, and then that's the only word they've ever learned in their entire life that thing that you shared, or maybe you even shared something, or, or you were talking to another adult, and you might have been talking to another adult about maybe somebody else in the family. 
maybe about someone out, you know? And then when that said person shows up, what does your child say? The truth. <laughs> or at least what you said. And, and so you have to understand that, that if you are, if you've been blessed by being a parent, you've been given this incredibly crazy, awesome gift to be what to them? Role model. Role model what else? Example. What else? Teacher. Come on, y'all parents, what are, you, what are you to be to them? Protector, provider. Their first experience with you is their first experience with God. Well, that's scary. <laughs> Amen. And I can tell you that I have not always been the perfect representation of God for my children. And you, you, can, you can give it your best and your all. And listen, you're not always going to be perfect. That's why God gave us his word to point to. That's why he gave us this model and this standard to go back to. Because as we already talked about before, if you raise up a child in which the way they should go, they will not depart from it. And if they do, what will they do? They'll return to it. Uh, our, our theme verse of this series is uh, Jeremiah 6, 16. It says, thus says the Lord, stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths or the old word where the good way lies and walk in it and find rest for your souls. But the people said, we will not walk in it. Ouch. Do we as society, are we really good at making up our own rules? Of course. Long it benefits us. Amen. As long as it benefits us. Because who in the world would make a rule for themselves and it would hold them back? <laughs> Amen. Is, is that just true? Uh, and, and so I, I just wish to, as we, we kind of look through this passage of Scripture, we are going to see how Elijah interacts with people who are just living life, who are just going through life and experiencing different things. There is about uh, five miracles in this one chapter that, that is there. We're going to kind of break it down. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was a supernatural event. Uh, Elijah cursed them, and then two she-bears just came out of the woods and mauled 42 kids. Most people would say, wow, that's a coincidence. <laughs> or they experienced the, um, I think what we've all experienced when we depart from God's path. I mean, some of y'all haven't been ravaged by two she-bears but certainly, hasn't it felt like that at times? There's things that some of y'all have been through, and you would have rather taken the she-bears. Amen? Uh, and, and so they were rejecting the presence of God coming into their city, and so the city experienced uh, what some theologians call that is a punitive miracle, a, a miracle that involves punishment. And that's the kind I don't want. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> that's the, like that's the kind you don't want in your life. Amen. Uh, so, but we're going to see five miracles in here. I'd love for you to try to find them, like uh, Danny and Art did. They they were trying to pinpoint some of the miracles there. But uh, we're going to just jump into chapter four, and we'll kind of see where it takes us. In verse one, it says, "Now the wife of a member of the company of who the prophets cried to Elisha, your servant, my husband." is what? Is dead. And you know that your servant feared Yahweh, or the Lord, but a creditor has come to take my what? Two sons. My two children, my two sons as slaves. Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me what to do. Do you have a house you live in? She answered, your servant has nothing in the house except what? A jar of oil. 
He said, go outside, borrow vessels from all your neighbors, empty the vessels, and not just a few. Then go in and shut the door behind you and your children and start pouring into all those vessels. When each is full, set it aside. So she left him, shut the door behind her and her children. They kept bringing vessels to her, and she kept pouring. When the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. But he said to her, what? There is no more. Then the oil stopped flowing. She came and told the man of God, and he said to her, go sell the oil and pay your what? Debts. And you and your children can live on the rest. Let's stop right there. What do we learn in this chapter right here? Uh, number one, what do we learn about the prophet who died? He was in debt. Danny, preachers get in debt? Yeah. Amen. We Listen, uh, we all get in debt, don't we? Of some way, shape, or form. I like the Lord's Prayer in which uh, we've all said it different. Amen. Because there's two versions in it. But it, it says this, that uh, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And forgive us our See, I like saying debts. What do some people say? Trespasses. That is a very fancy word. What is a trespass? That, oh, I like, Danny's like, that's concealed evil. Well, and, and I would just even build upon that. That is a, uh, a willful act of sin against another. And so, but I like debt because it covers the whole thing. Whenever we sin, it inquires debt. Not just debt to the person, but you see, before you ever hurt or sin against another person, you sin against God, the one who gave you life. When you step outside of the mark that he has given us to live in, we are stepping out of his way for us, the, the ancient path, the, the word that he spoke, we're stepping out of it, and so we are in, inquiring a debt upon ourselves. And I, I love this idea of being debt-free. I mean, who doesn't, I mean, doesn't that just sound wonderful? I mean, just to be debt-free. In the Jewish law, if you inquired a debt and you could not pay it, then you would have to go into sort of indentured servitude to pay off said debt. But here's the thing. Every, like, 50 years there was this thing called the year of Jubilee. How many of you have ever heard that? It's so amazing, like, because every seven years, they have like a year, a fasting year in the Jewish calendar. But when you have seven years of seven fastings, it becomes the 50th year, and that is the year of Jubilee in which any debt that you've ever in, in, inquired is canceled. If you or your family members were serving as slaves, you are set, what? Free. And any land that you lost that belonged to your family, that land was returned back to your family. Man, how many of y'all are just like, hey, let's sign up America for the year of Jubilee. Boy, wouldn't that be just the wildest thing? It's just like, you're sitting there waiting, come on, you're 50. I know I'm 51, but come on, Lord. Right? I mean, to experience a, a time in which everybody celebrated becoming free. Now, I want to tell you this. Christ has set you free. He has set you free. When, what Jesus sets free, it is free indeed. And I'm still learning what that means in my life. Because there are still things in this world and in this life that trip us up, that snare us. Amen? And I'm still learning that less of me and more of him is more freedom. This prophet was in debt. And because he was in debt, he left his family with a burden and now his children and his wife was going to suffer because of that burden that he left them. And so she turned to the prophet Elisha. 
And what was his solution? Yeah, he's like, well, what do you have in the house? <laughs> it's, like, it's like, what do you have? She goes, I have nothing. He's like, well, what do you have in the house? Why? I just got this little bit of oil, right? And I love what he tells us. He's like, all right, grab every vessel, like, and whatever you think you have, grab more, as many vessels as you can. I'm wondering in her head how this is working because when they gather all those vessels, I can almost see in picture in my head all various sizes, all scattered around her living area. And she's taking this little thing of oil and she's filling everything up to what? Come on, bro. I'd fill that thing up to the brim. I mean, how do y'all put Mountain Dew in your cup? I've seen some of you. With your sweet tea? I've seen it, right? Uh, come on, if you ask for queso and they put a little bit in that tub, uh-uh, amen. That's what I, I'd say, uh-uh. You know, if you're paying four bucks for queso, you want it where? To the brim. Come on, you want it to the brim. I guarantee you that she was pouring and she put it to capacity and then she moved on to the next one and filled it what? To capacity. She filled every one of those to capacity and then she said to her kid is like, grab another bucket. There, are, there is no more. Amen. Can I tell you that, and I, I used to love um, helping my daughters do things because when they're really small, like they needed that. There was a time in which you had to do everything for them. And then they get to this period of time where they're like, I could do it myself. I mean, she was like, how many of you are in that area with your kid right now? And he's like, I could do it myself, you know? And so sometimes you let them. Amen? Sometimes you step back and you're like, all right, get hurt. Right? And sometimes you and sometimes you gotta kind of monitor. There was a time when Allie, she began to make her own chocolate milk. And I thought that was wonderful. You know, because you know, I know it only takes like a minute or two, but when your kids start to do things that interrupt your day, that's pretty cool. But after a while, I just noticed us, we were going through like chocolate syrup like crazy amount, you know? I was like, why are we going through so much chocolate syrup? And so one day as Allie was, I, I walked in the kitchen and she knew because right when I walked in, she started acting weird, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, you walk into a room and your kid's doing something, they start acting weird or like nothing, and you don't even ask them anything. And she was like, nothing, nothing, you know? I was like, well, wait a minute. And uh, so I went over and her cup was this, thick with chocolate syrup, like this thick, like this thick. I'm like, Allie, do you drink chocolate milk like this all the time? And she goes, I do it my own way, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting there thinking, man, our babies are going to have diabetes <laughs> under our watch because we're just like, well, they do it. But man, so we was like, oh, we're going to limit this, you know. Can I tell you, though? that Jesus don't ever want you to limit him in your life. He never will tell you too much Holy Spirit. He will never say, I've given you too much of me. You see, it's our taste and desire and longing for him. If you want more of him, there's more of him to be had. It's just like this woman with that oil. She kept on pouring because there was, an, there was capacity to hold it. It stopped when there was no more what? No more buckets. I think there are some, sometimes, and some uh, times in our lives, where we become like a cracked vessel. Can I tell you that I serve a God? He is a master craftsman. He could patch every hole. I mean, hey, he can give you a completely new vessel. Isn't that him? He wants to do that for us. He wants to fill us to capacity with himself. Amen. And he did a miracle for this woman. And she was able to not only pay off her debts, but to live on the money that was left over. That's just a beautiful thing that God did for this, this uh, widow of a prophet. And we don't know anything else more about her story. And then we move on to the next moment. Elisha's just going through life here. Look at this chapter, uh, verse 11, or excuse me, verse 8. It says, one day Elisha was passing through Shunem, where a, what kind of a woman? A wealthy woman lived, who urged him to have a meal. So 
whenever he passed that way, he would stop there for a meal. Boy, Elisha was a real preacher. I can tell you that, man. That's just funny. She said to her husband, look, I am sure that this man who regularly passes our way is a holy man of God. Let us make a small roof chamber with walls and put there for him a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp so that he may stay there whenever he comes to us. One day when he came there, he went up to the chamber and lay there. He said to his servant, Gehazi, call the Shudamite woman. And when he had called her, she stood there before him. He said to him, say to her, since you have taken all this trouble for us, what may be done for you? Would you have a word spoken on your behalf to the king or the commander of the army? She answered, I live among my own people. He said, what then may be done for her? Gehazi answered, well, she has no son and her husband is old. He said, call her. When he had called her, she stood at the door and he said, at this season in due time, you shall embrace a son. And she replied, no, my Lord, O man of God, do not deceive your servant. The woman conceived and bore a son at that season in due time, as Elisha had declared to her. When the child was older, he went out one day with his father among the reapers. He complained to his father, O oh, my head, my head. And the father said to the servant, carry him to who? His mother. He carried him and brought him to his mother, and the child sat on her lap until noon, and he died. She went up and laid him on whose bed? The bed of the man of God, and closed the door on him and left. Then she called her husband and said, send me one of your servants and one of the donkeys, so that I may quickly go on to the man of God and come back again. He said, why go to him today? Is it a new moon or a Sabbath? He said, or she said, it will be what? It will be all right. Then she saddled the donkey and said to her servant, urge the animal on, do not hold back for, um, do not hold back for me unless I tell you. So she set out and came to the man of God, where? At Mount Carmel. When the man of God saw her coming, he said to Gehazi, his servant, Look, there is the Shudamite woman. Run at once to meet her and say to her, Are you all right? Is your husband all right? Is your child all right? She answered, It is all right. Or, It is well. Sort of like she said to her husband. When she came to the man of God at the mountain, she caught hold of his feet. Gehazi approached to push her away. But the man of God said, let her alone, for she is in bitter distress. Yahweh, or the Lord, has hidden it from me and has not told me. Then she said, did I ask my Lord for a son? Did I not say, do not mislead me? He said to Gehazi, gird your loins and take my staff in your hand and go. If you meet anyone or greet anyone, if anyone greets you, do not answer and lay my staff upon the face of the child. Then the mother of the child said, as the Lord lives and as yourself live, I will not leave without you. So he arose up and followed her. Gehazi went on ahead and laid the staff on the face of the child and there was no sound or sign of what? Life in him. He came back to meet him and told him, the child has not awakened. When Elisha came into the house, he saw the child lying dead on his bed. So he went in, closed the door on the two of them, and prayed to the Lord. Then he got up on the bed and lay upon the child, putting his mouth upon his mouth, his eyes upon his eyes, and his hands upon his hands. And while he lay bent over him, the flesh of the child became what? Warm. He got up walked once to and fro in the room and got up again and bent over him and the child sneezed, <laughs> how many times? Seven times. And the child opened his eyes. Elisha summoned Gehazi and said, call the Shunammite woman. So he called her and when she came to him, he said, take your son. She came and fell at his feet, bowing to the ground and she took her son and left. We'll stop right there. This is the most fascinating story. 
I mean, here's Elisha. He's just doing his thing. He's just traveling. And this one wealthy woman said, hey, won't you stay with us? And she builds him his own room. And she feeds him. Whenever he comes around, she feeds him. You know, there was a time in the old school church that a preacher, man, he would just eat with a family after every service. They'd go eat. Sheldon Lewis told me a story when he was one of many kids, or not, well, it was like a little community. He only had one sibling. But they would all get together as, as children, and the preacher would come over to the house, and they wouldn't even let the kids sit at the table. There was 11 of y'all. And, and, and they would uh, just kind of sit off to the side, and they'd wait for the adults to finish to eat. And they'd be sitting there watching that preacher, saying, oh, Lord, please don't let him eat the leg. Don't let him eat the leg. Lord, come on, no. Save some chicken for us, amen. Uh, this, we have sort of a situation here with Elijah. He would be taking care of this family. And so in this uh, generosity, he wanted to bless this family and somehow. And what, was, what did she want from him? She didn't want anything from him. Who, who even brought this up? Elisha's servant Gehazi. Now listen, he's a very interesting character. We're going to have to keep an eye on old Gehazi. He is very interesting. I, I really think he's fascinating. He's the one who brought this up. And he's like, well, you know, because Gehazi has an eye for looking at needs or what somebody doesn't have. And this might get him in trouble later. I'm just giving you like a, a preview. But he, he says, well, you know, she doesn't have a son and her husband's old. Amen. And so Elisha, he prophesies over, you're going to have a child in due season. You know, in the Hebrew, you can look at the word in due season. It means springtime when life begins. And so right around this time, she has a child, and, and many years go by. This, this, we don't know how old the child was, but it was probably old enough to go out by himself with his dad, maybe seven to ten years old. He was a, a kind of a young child, and all of a sudden, he just, he just dies. What ca catches your attention in this story? This is just a wild story. Yeah, his, his mother, when she gets the child... She leaves. She puts him in the room, and she leaves. And listen, what was the conversation like with her husband? Everything's all right. Everything will be well. I, I wonder in this story, when the husband said, hey, take him to his mother, that he didn't know what happened after that. I, I just, you know, that's how us men are sometimes. Take him to his mama. I'm going to keep on working, you know? And when he gets back, she's leaving. And maybe in his man mind, it's like, well, I guess everything's all right. Why do you want to see the man of God? It's not even like time to worship or anything. And she goes, everything will be well. It is well. It is well. She believed it was going to be well. She had faith it was going to be well. So a part of me wonders if the husband even knew that his son had died. Because she was going to the man of God. She was going to the man she felt who could do what? Fix it. Help. And when she approached there, what happened? Because he was like, hey, there's that Shudamite woman. Hey, Gehazi, ask what's going on. And what did she tell Gehazi? Everything is well. <laughs> I mean, the man, it's like she's a good old Baptist woman. She came to church. She's like, how are you doing? Everything's fine. And everything's on fire. You know? Everything in her life is just on fire. Like, I'm, everything's just fine. Everything's fine. I'm fine. They're fine. We're fine. But things were not fine. Amen? Things were definitely not fine. And I love what Elisha lets us know when he finds out. What does he say? Did y'all catch that? The Lord concealed this from me. Meaning the Lord didn't let me know what was going on. Hey, newsflash, man, there's a lot of times where the Lord just didn't let us know. Amen. But can I tell you, there's a purpose in it. Amen. There's a, when there's some things you don't know, you might be mad about it, but at the end of the day, somewhere, somehow, it's going to work out for your benefit. 
Because let me ask you, there are some things, if you had known, what would you have done? Some of y'all would have ended up in jail. Amen. <laughs> some of y'all would have been locked up. If, <laughs> if <they're, laughs> Amen. I was just, I'm just being real. Because there's just some things God conceals from us. Because why? Because one, his ways are not our ways. And oftentimes he's protecting us and others from ourselves. And in this moment, he's providing a story for us. Amen. Because, Danny, what would have been the story, though? I exactly. If God told Elisha that was going to happen, and he showed up before the woman ever got to put her faith into what? Action. Because it's different from having faith from walking in faith. There is just times in which I've had to tell myself, I just have to walk it out. It's one thing to believe it, but it's another thing to walk your faith out. Amen? God put this woman in a situation to walk what she believed out, and she made the journey. And there's been times in our lives in which we felt like we didn't have the strength to make the journey, but all you have to do is take the first step, and God will take the, the rest. How many of you can testify in which God, He took the rest? Jesus, when He came to earth, it took, before He ever bled on the cross, He bled in the garden. It says in Luke that he sweated blood. Before he ever gave himself on the cross, he gave himself to the Father in the garden through prayer. And so there's things that we're not ready for because our prayer ain't there. Amen? There's some things that we want to do for the Lord, and the Lord's like, hey, uh, why don't you connect with me a little bit? Amen? Before we walk it out, we've got to start somewhere. Amen? Someone asked me, how did you learn to preach? And I, and I said, I'm still learning. I'm still learning. But I, I would love to tell some younger people uh, feeling called into that, that, the best way you'll ever learn how to preach is you learn how to pray for your, your wife and your family. The best way to ever learn how to preach is learn how to speak to people. The best way to learn how to preach is to, man, make time for those who are hurting. Because God, he's already given us the word. He's already given us the word. He already knows what we're going to say before we even say it. But the best way for you to ever preach a sermon is to live one. Go be a sermon for somebody. So that they can experience the word of God and how you live and speak to them. Amen? This woman put the steps in. She showed up and she said, everything's fine, but it wasn't. And she said, why'd you even give me a son? How many of you parents? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's like, Lord, why did you give this person? <laughs> Amen? I don't know if you've ever been there, you know, with your, your kids. Because, uh, you know, there's some parents here that I know. Because you've just had to hand your children over. Amen? Like, Lord, because I know some of your stories. At a certain point, you're just like, Lord, they're yours. And God's like, I've been waiting. I've been waiting for you to let go of that stress and anger and anguish and pain and suffering and just let me do my, my job now. Yes, ma'am. Wow. Amen. Uh, prayer was easier than you thought, wasn't it? Amen. I think, uh, not in the beginning, but of course it is a discipline and it does require some attention. 
Uh, some of us have spiritual ADD, <laughs> where we'll begin to pray to the Lord, but then we have all, sometimes we will pray ourselves right back into worries that we were worried about. <laughs> it's like, Lord, I just want you to take care of this. <laughs> we just go right back into circular thought uh, over like our burdens and our, our things that we're worried about, in which God just is like, keep your face, turn towards my face. Keep your eyes on me. Know that I am going to take care of this. I, I love this story because he was going to send his servant with his, his staff to just heal the child. Well, how'd that work out? <laughs> Listen, guys, this is amazing. Elijah didn't know what was going on, and he sent his servant with his staff of power, amen, and nothing happened. Who is really doing the healing? The Lord. Who really has it all in his hands? Who really knows everything? God. Listen, we are messengers. People get incredibly a lot of trouble when they forget that they're the messenger and not the Lord. Man, we get in a lot of trouble when we try to elevate ourselves into God's position. Yes, sir. Mm. Amen. Amen. Uh, so about, like, did y'all catch what, how he healed this kid or what God led him to do? Did y'all, I mean, what was weird about that? Nose to nose, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. I mean, because Elijah, when he went up in the upper room, he shut the door behind him. I mean, I just want to ask you, if you took any of your sick family members to the doctor and the doctor's like, I'll take care of this. <laughs> and they start doing what Elijah was doing. I mean, what would you do? <laughs> it's like, uh, oh, oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. You'd, you'd probably get a little upset, you know. Um, but uh, when we look at this passage of Scripture, we, one we have to, to understand and, and realize in, uh, is Brother Danny, I think Brother George might be having a, yeah, but... Um, We'll pray for Brother George. I think he might be having a, an asthma attack. Um, but uh, when we look at this passage of Scripture, you, you could let the mechanics of the miracle, uh, one, overshadow the fact that this kid's raised uh, from life. But I, I was thinking, because every commentary I read and every like book I read, I was like, why this, though? Why? You know, It was like that moment when Jesus made mud and rubbed it in the kid's eye. You know, you know what I'm saying? It, it's, it's like, why that way? You know? And you have to understand everything in Scripture is tied to everything. In some way, shape, or form, it's all tied to Scripture. And so I want you to think of creation. In the beginning, when God made Adam, how did he make Adam? One, he formed him from the dust of the earth, amen, and then he did what? He breathed the breath of life in him. When this little boy was laying on the bed dead, the first time he got on this child and put his eyes to eyes, mouth to mouth, hands to hand, his body, what did it do? It warmed up. And then he got up, he went to and fro, and then get back on the child, and then what happened? <laughs> he sneezed seven times. <laughs> you know, that's just funny. You, you got to understand, before you ever sneeze, what do you have to do? <gasps> you got to breathe in, right? Before you ever sneeze, you got to breathe in. And so in this one moment, we can see almost the creation story. And how many did he sneeze? 
how many days are in the days of creation story? Six days of work, seven, day of, seven days. In this moment, it's almost like Elisha is having a creation moment with, or, or recreation or reawakening moment with his child. Like Adam, he shaped him from the ground. He was flesh, but he was missing something. And God put the breath of life in him. And I got to tell you, too, it reminds me of this scripture that God made us in his image and his reflection. Amen? Eyes to eyes, mouth to mouth, hands to hand, we were made in his image. And a little bit later in scripture, we have Ezekiel in which the, the valley of the dry bones, in which God told Ezekiel, he had a vision, and he said, can these bones live? And he said, Lord, you know it. And so he prophesied to the bones, and God put muscle and sinew upon the bones, and then he prophesied to the Spirit, and the Spirit came in and made them alive. It's one thing to be alive, but it's a totally different thing to live. Amen? Amen. That's what, I mean, when I look at this, I, I point back to the creation story. We, we can see the elements of that in this. Um, but but that's, that's just how my mind was working, trying to, to see how scripture umbrellas this one moment. But this kid, he comes back to life. Amen, it's, it's truly amazing. Well, any other questions or comments or, yes, sir? Amen. Amen. Did you hear what Brother Jackie said? He said in each story, the, uh, the widow and the Shunammite woman, uh, Elijah went in and he shut the door. The widow shut the door. When they went inside for the miracle to happen, they shut the door. And didn't Jesus say, when you go and pray, enter into your secret place. And some power can happen when you shut the door. When you're just with, with God. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. And isn't it like us? We like our habits. We don't have every story about Elisha that he probably did on the earth. And there are probably times in which he would, would send a servant with a staff to do something, and it would happen. And I'm sure just like the disciples in the New Testament, when that uh, father brought his son to them to heal him of the demonic, and they couldn't do it. They were arguing about maybe they did it wrong, you know. And the only thing was wrong is, as Jesus said, these can only come out through prayer and fasting. And it goes right back to what my brother Jackie just said, is prayer, is, is connecting with God and um, walking things out that whatever is like just distracting you the most, that's where your prayers need to be. Whatever is causing you the, the most distraction or pain, that's where your prayers need to be. Yes, yes, sir. How many of you ever had, like my brother's talking about, how many of you ever had a still moment? Like it was actually still? And like everything, you just let everything go. I mean, it's the most amazing thing in the world. 
when you actually have a still moment. You know, and it's the craziest thing. Some of us will go years, like, like in this almost cycle. And when we get finally get to a, what? Like a breaking point. And then we're, we're either forced to be still or people who actually love us and see us say, hey, you need to be still. Amen? And when you actually let it all go, it's the most amazing feeling. And listen, if you have not experienced what I am talking about, it's going to happen. Amen. She said, being by yourself and alone is powerful. Rest is a weapon. I want you to think about it. Rest can be a powerful weapon. Jesus, did he not rest in the Gospels? And even when he was trying to rest, what would happen? Jesus, we need you. Right? But he still what? Man, his capacity was large. He looked at them and had compassion on them. But, but listen, you're not Jesus. <laughs> Amen? There's some of y'all that need to hear this. You're not Jesus. Jesus, he, his desire is to live in you and put a spirit in you, but you don't have to get on the cross and martyr yourself. He did that for us so that we can be free in him. And th there are, are some of us carrying a burden and a load that he's never asked you to carry because he carried it to the cross. And being still can be a mighty weapon for Jesus, for him to reveal things about you. I think that's why a lot of people had the most trouble with the pandemic. You know, uh, it stopped everything, and so we actually were stuck with who? Who? <laughs> You're right, girl. Hey, listen, in, in, listen, in China, there was a province in China when they lifted the, the isolation mandate. In one prover, uh, province, there was over 80 divorces scheduled. <laughs> that's rough. But yeah, that's, that's something else, right? Because uh, being stuck with yourself sometimes is is enough. But when you're stuck with others, man, that's something else too. That's a whole other thing. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Amen. Because people can only take you so far. Amen. It's, did you hear me? People can only take you so far. Jesus, he takes you forever. Amen. He has you long term. All right, but amen, that's very good. What else, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Mm. He was dead, yeah. He was dead. And it reminds me of the use of healing, the healing 
Amen. Amen. Everything about this miracle echoes back to God. Amen. God did this. God uh, gave this family an opportunity to experience a reunion that is impossible. This is the first resurrection in the Bible. I think we do have to you know, always look at themes in the Bible. Of course, Jesus rides in on a donkey. Um, she rides a, do- a donkey to the prophet. Um, there's a scene in, uh, where David is, actually it's a reverse of the triumphal entry. David is fleeing Jerusalem on a donkey because his son Absalom has taken the kingdom from him. And it's a reverse of what we see Jesus coming into. So there is some very interesting, like uh, I would say, look at those themes there. Um, but, uh, amen. Yeah, an, an animal. Well, we would say an animal of peace, but if you've ever owned one, uh, <laughs> if you've if you've ever owned one, uh, yes, sir. Well, I just think it's very interesting that Elisha is spending time in a place in which his former predecessor had this greatest victory. Uh, Amen. Um, So it is interesting he's hanging around a place that is depicted as a great victory for for Yahweh. Um, And uh, what else? Any any other questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. Amen. It's uh, and um, some sometimes our journey it seems a long time. Amen. But seven seven times is a number of completion. Now, just you know, going whatever you got going on, God might not want to happen seven times. I'm <laughs> just telling you. But uh, it is that is the number of completion. It's it is it is. And uh, that boy, he had been given his life back. Oh yeah. Um, well, so uh, any other questions or comments or, well, church, we almost finished the chapter tonight. We almost did it. Amen. Um, and I, I would tell you that there are more miracles in this chapter. I would tell you, man, check them out. Um, th- thank you all for coming out to Wednesday night Bible study. And I said earlier, we're going to be lifting up George. Was he having uh, an attack? He was, and so we'll just pray for him that God will give him his breath back, amen, and that he feels loved and prayed for. Um, But uh, well, let's stand up and go to the Lord in prayer. Would you pray with me, Lord Jesus? uh, We just want to lift up George to you right now, uh, God, that he would just experience um, uh, freedom in just breathing. And Lord, um, I've never had asthma, and and I know some people who do, and Lord, um, I just ask that you would just touch him right now and open up his lungs and give him healing. And Father, I just want to thank you for Misty, his wife. Lord, we just cover his family in prayer. And Lord, we ask that you will just continue the work in power and, and every request lifted up tonight, Lord. You are still the God that was with Elijah and Elisha, God. And Lord, you're still the God who left the tomb, Lord. And there's still things that you can breathe life into. Father, we thank you, we praise you, we ask all this in Jesus' name, all God's people say. Amen. Amen. Love y'all. Thank y'all.